Uh, tell us more about the role of induction in physics. So, um, so basically, uh, the role in, of induction in physics is kind of the same as the role of induction in any other subject. As I said, you need to know why a principle is true in order to even apply that principle correctly. So here's, here's an example. Um, in early physics, um, everyone laughed at the idea that the sun was at the center of the solar system because this would mean that the earth would have to move. And everyone thought that this is crazy because, well, movement requires force, which means that we would always feel as though the earth we're getting pushed all the time. We would feel pushed by the earth. If the earth was moving, it would require that we always be hanging on for dear life as, you know, as the earth careens around the sun at these incredible speeds that Galileo and Copernicus are, are suggesting. Um, and the reason, but this is based on a faulty assumption. It's based on the assumption that you need force to cause motion. And in most cases, it's true. In most cases, you do need force to cause motion. You know, in order to push an object across a table, you have to keep pushing it or else it'll slow down. So, so well, what's the problem? It was like, well, if that assumption was based on observation, then what was wrong with it? What was wrong is, is that they didn't actually check the assumption. How do you know the cause of why things slow down? And because they didn't have an answer to that, they applied the principle in a case where it didn't apply. You don't need continued force to keep the earth moving through the vacuum of space, although they didn't necessarily know it was a vacuum. But in general, you don't need force to cause continued motion. You need force only to cause a change in motion. So if there are no opposing forces like friction, the, the earth will just keep going at the speed it's going. And so because people didn't ask, how do we know that's true? They applied their principle, which was kind of a true principle. Generally, you do need to push on stuff in order to keep it moving. Because they didn't ask, why is that principle true? They applied the principle to a case where it didn't actually make sense. And this is universal in modern physics. Physicists don't know the proof of the concepts and generalizations they use. They're, repeat, they're assuming that previous physicists got it right which on some level might be, in some cases, it might be justified, like, you know, after all, buildings aren't collapsing and stuff like that. But if you don't know the actual proof, you don't know when to apply it. And so I think, um, so in that, that's why modern physics desperately needs induction. It desperately needs an inductive proof of these, this enormous edifice of prior knowledge that we just kind of take for granted and until we stop taking it for granted and actually proving it we won't see new fundamental progress in physics right okay um many of our listeners may be aware of the book the logical leap where david harriman and leonard peikoff present a theory of induction um is there anything you would add or amend on the, to, uh, and is there any way you would add to or amend the theory of induction presented in that book? Um, so first, I'd say before I talk about anything I would amend or add, I'll say that the logical leap is absolutely revolutionary. It, it's in it, I mean, I couldn't have done any of my work without the logical leap. I'd have to do everything David Harriman did first if I were to do what I'm doing now. So oh, yeah. any, yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, well, this, I mean, so I, even though I will make certain criticisms in a couple minutes, like I want to make that really clear. Anything I do, including the amendments, should be considered essentially building off of uh, Leonard Peikoff and David Harriman, not some sort of rejection of it, even though I will, I'm about to sort of emphasize certain things I do disagree with. So, you know, I'm, I'm putting that up front to, to yep. um, make that clear. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing that that book uh, does is, is it shows us that knowledge has to come in a certain inductive order, that the only way to understand, you know, the only way to reason from observations is to go in a particular order. And Harriman, by giving tons of examples of that in the book and also um, in his lecture series that he has on the Van Dam Academy, 
it shows you step by step what it means to reason inductively, what it means to build your knowledge on top of your prior knowledge and what it means to actually integrate new observations with prior knowledge and how you and he gives the general idea of how you go from one step to another i don't think he makes a lot of it explicit but he shows you how it can be done and for that um it's 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 revolutionary it and it's so revolutionary that i think a lot of people who read it and even objectivists who read it and really engaged with it seriously didn't understand its main point um, and like one one way to see this is, is a lot of the criticisms you'll see will um, will say well yeah, the thing is I think they're serious criticisms but they're but they're seriously um, um, well I don't know they're they're serious criticisms but I I disagree with them so I mean for there example a lot of, a lot of times a lot of yeah. what's that that book got a lot of criticism yeah for it, a lot of a lot of different reasons a lot of people clearly didn't understand the book yeah like. Uh, what's his name, McKeskey and those sorts of people? Well, Mc people. Um, my jury is actually out on McKeskey because we have yet to see what his view of induction is. Uh, from what I understand, he's writing his own book. So I'm going to wait, actually. And I've seen McKeskey write certain things that actually really helped my thinking. Um, so we'll see. Um, okay. So, But although a lot really of his criticisms, probably. actually, we'll talk about the McKeskey criticisms or I'll talk about them right now since we brought them up. I think, so McCaskey yep. criticizes the, um, this is one of the minor criticisms. But they're not one of the more important ones, but it's worth noting. McCaskey criticizes the, uh, the logical leap um, because a lot of times it's historical accounts don't, um, aren't accurate, basically. And as far as I can tell, McCaskey's right about this. Um, well, I mean, um, McCaskey gives really good arguments for the fact that David Harriman a lot of times almost changes the history. Um, there, for example, uh, McCaskey gives this one example where of uh, tr uh, Harriman's treatment of Galileo's um, induction of um, the law of free fall. And when Galileo was thinking about the law of free fall, Galileo was getting two things, two concepts packaged, deal, dealt together, namely air resistance and buoyancy. He was getting them packaged, dealt together. Um, and I'm not sure why Galileo was confused about that, but he, he, Galileo really was confused about that. And, but what Harriman does in his treatment Harriman just brushes past that entire confusion Galileo had in order to make the story simpler. Yeah, do you think maybe he, he um, Harriman was trying to he was trying to simplify some yeah. very complex stuff. Do you think maybe he oversimplified it? Think some things a little bit maybe. I don't think, do you he think oversimplified, it, but he do you think didn't. It, or do you think it's some of, do you think it's some locations are justified? But you just have to sort of read between the lines a bit. Yeah, the, the, the simplifications are justified, but Harriman doesn't justify them. He just makes them and then, like, I guess hopes you won't think they're a big deal. Now, I didn't think they were a big deal, but McCaskey, as I, and, I, and, and from what I can tell, McCaskey's a very serious student of the history of physics. In fact, he's almost like too, from what I can tell, it's almost like he's too focused on the actual history. What in uh, um, so and Harriman really did seem to amend the history. So what's the so what's the deal here? My solution to this is is that Harriman faces like a huge obstacle, which is that the history of physics is full of um, wrong turns and not to mention just minor wrinkles, like this thing with Galileo, where he's getting buoyancy and mm. and air resistance, like buoyancy of the how much the ball floats in air versus how the ball is ramming into air on its way down. And, and Galileo didn't have the, um, the, the, I mean, Galileo could have gotten straight on this actually based on things that were available to, at, to him at the time, but it turns out he just didn't. Harriman just basically decided, hey, I'm gonna simplify this by just pretending Galileo wasn't confused about this. And I think that is fine because based on his context of knowledge at the time, Galileo didn't have to be confused on that. 
in fact, you, in fact, in my treatment, what, so, and so this leads me to like my, my base, so a difference between me and the logical leap and, and almost like Dar David Harriman's approach um, is that I don't really focus on the history. I treat the history as a kind of suggestion. What really matters, what's essential is the order that all of this stuff could have been discovered. Um, and so as a result, as long as you're clear that this is a fictional streamlined account, you can make these simplifications. So I think Harriman was thinking that way implicitly because he recognized that this little wrinkle of Galileo's wasn't essential. But on mm. what standard was it not essential? He doesn't explain that. The standard on, and so I will, the standard on which it's not, these little, little wrinkles are not essential, is that we're interested in understanding how to generalize from observation. To do that, we don't need to actually explain every detail of the actual history. We can streamline it, and, and as long as it's a path that is logical, a path that it could have been discovered in, we don't need to worry about these details. To be fair to McCaskey, though, um, McCaskey hints somewhere in his writings that his focus on these historical differences is actually important to his, to, to, like, it, it actually has, it actually uh, manifests differences in his theory of induction. So we'll see what happens with, with that, with McCaskey. So a criticism that, another criticism that the logical leap got, and I think this was a justified one, it was like 50% justified, is that it doesn't actually solve the problem of induction. And I think this is true. I think the logical leap doesn't actually give you the um, basic process by which we make generalizations. I don't think it does that. I think it solves the hard part, which is that you have to think in an inductive order. You can only, whenever you attack a certain issue in physics, you have to be clear on what context of knowledge you're using if you're gonna wanna, if you're gonna understand how induction works. What a lot of modern philosophers of science will do is they'll take every, they'll treat every piece of knowledge in physics as just equal in the hierarchy. They'll just say, oh, well, this is true, and this is true, and this is true. Oh, but Newton didn't understand Einstein, so I guess Newton was just wrong. They don't understand, I mean, like, yeah, they'll, they'll make really noob errors like this. Um, they'll make, you know, just, they're very silly errors once you realize that knowledge has to come in this particular order. And so, and there's a lot, of, and there's ways to get that wrong that are not nearly as obvious as I just stated them. And Harriman solves that by, by demonstrating how it works over and over again. The serious student of the logical leap can understand the basic way, how the basic way our context of knowledge grows with observation and, and reasoning steps and further observation and further reasoning steps. So, um, you know, I, the way I put it, would put it is this. It's true that it doesn't solve the problem of induction when it claims to. But the book is so powerful that I uh, can't help but be a little uh, mad at the detractors um, because I think they really de-emphasized what, um, what the book gets right. Um, the, way David, or the way Harry Benzwanger puts it is that it breaks the back of the, of the problem of induction. And that's true. It solves the hard part. There's still additional work to do. So it doesn't, I don't think it gives you the basic way that we generalize from observation. But it, it solves the hard part. It solves the main obstacle that was in people's way. And, um, and so, and so um, yeah, so that... I can't, I can't say enough good things about the book. Um, but uh, here's, here's the main thing I would add to it. And, it has, and, and I think this does at least solve a part of the solution to the problem of induction. It shows you what, what I have in mind in my working theory of induction that I'm, that I'm working on and will apply is that I, I think I've identified one way that we can make generalizations by integrating our knowledge. Um, and, uh, Peacock doesn't really do that. So for example, he talks about first level generalizations. He talks about, 
how um how say like a, a kid he looks at a ball and he sees that it rolls and so he comes to a generalization balls roll well now a lot of valid criticism has arised in the fact like well how does he know that balls generally roll and then further they'll say that the book has a similar problem later and this is a valid criticism they'll say um you know uh later in the book harriman talks about how kepler concluded planets obey my three laws kepler comes up with three laws of planetary motion and and Harriman says, you know, Kepler um, immediately generalized and said, like, all planets follow this pattern. And the criticisms are, well, again, on what basis did he generalize? And Harriman doesn't have an answer to this. He doesn't show how exactly what by what process you make the connection. You, you actually say, well, what was it, for example, in the case of Kepler's third laws, how do you know this would apply to all planets? And I mean, for that particular example, I don't think Kepler did know it. I don't think Kepler did know it would apply to all planets. He didn't know what it was about planets that caused them to follow his law. Newton then figured it out, but we have to, if we're going to see, if we're going to have a um, rigorous account of how we generalize, we're going to need more details than what Harriman gives, and that's gonna come out in this uh, paper um, that I'm working on right now. Tell us about the role of mathematics in physics. Ooh, this, I, I'm glad you asked this question, um, <laughs> because, so I think mathematics is very important in physics. Um, uh, you had on your show earlier Bill Gade, who I feel like he disparaged mathematics uh, too much. Mm. Yeah. He, um, his, it's almost like, yeah, I mean, so he, he, um, I think he really let modern physicists give mathematics a bad name because everything he says about them, I don't know about everything, but like a lot of what he says about them is a hundred percent true. They're thinking about the math. They're trying to, modern physicists are trying to derive mathematical schemes to basically, um, identify patterns in the observation they're fundamentally unconcerned with whether their schemes and hypotheses actually refer to some physical cause and effect relationship. Um, you know, like they're, they're not really concerned if space is literally a thing that bends. Um, if, you, if you ask, how do you know that space is literally a thing that bends? They just kind of won't answer the question. Like how, do you, like, how do you know? They just like, ah, that's not really my department. Like that's kind of a philosophy question. Um, so anyway, like he's right that there's an overemphasis in mathematics, but mathematics itself is insanely important in physics. Um, and here's a couple re here's a couple ways. It's um, mathematics first of all is necessary for identifying cause and uh, identifying cause and effect relationships in certain contexts. If you see, for example, that um, you know as you increase the mass of a body a given force um, will accelerate the body less. You see that the mass retards the acceleration and you see that there's an inverse proportional relationship. The math has now told you that there's a cause and effect relationship between those. And actually, so to sort of correct something I said earlier, the logical leap does thoroughly explain that way of establishing a generalization. If, if um, so that's, so that's one way is through, it's what uh, John Stuart Mill called a concomitant variation. It means as you vary the amount of one thing, the amount of the other thing varies with it in a controlled set of observations, such as an experiment. Um, when that happens, you know that there's something about mass that retards acceleration. It doesn't necessarily tell you what it is about mass that retards the acceleration, but it shows you that there is a cause and effect relationship. You can't grasp these things without math. Um, in addition, math tells us the kind of cause and effect relationship a lot of times. Like, so for example, with the inverse square law, um, gravity obeys an inverse square law. It means that the further away from the planet you get or from the source of gravitation you get, the weaker the force is, and, it's, and it just so happens when Newton discovered it, 
that it got weaker is the square of the distance. So if you double the distance, it's, it's one fourth of the force. If you triple the distance, it's one ninth the force. When you, you would think if you tripled the distance, it would be one third the force, but it's one ninth. It's the square of the distance. Then later, I'm not sure who, but someone realized that an inverse square law is totally consistent with the hypothesis that the sun or the gravitational object is shooting some sort of stuff in every direction. And the reason is, is because the area of a sphere depends on its radius squared. So if that stuff is diluting itself over the, like the square of a radius, then um, you get the inverse square law. So I think this basically, I mean, unless, unless some other explanation could be found, but the only explanation that is possible in our context of knowledge is that gravitation works through some sort of spherically spreading effect. And so you couldn't, and you couldn't, you couldn't identify this without math. So math tells you the, the, the nature of the cause and effect relationship also. Um, so don't, don't let modern physicists let math give, give math a bad name. Math is fantastic. It's just the way it's taught and thought about that's boring as hell and it looks useless, but it isn't. Uh, who are some of your favorite people in physics, dead or alive? Dead physicists. Um, I mean, there's too many to name, but I'll just, I'll just give you two. Um, and I'll give you sort of um, lesser known aspects. So first Newton and um, I mean, his, I mean, his genius, I don't need to go through the genius of everything he did. He, he figured out mechanics, he figured out gravitation, he figured out, um, he figured out uh, the, some basic properties of light. He was one of the first people to really seriously employ um, experimentation and induction in practice. Um, in on on levels that had never been seen before so his his genius goes without saying but something i'll say that i think a lot of people don't know about newton i think one of newton's major achievements was his the ethical life he lived i think part of the key to newton's genius was his unsullied commitment to truth like just absolute dedication to the truth and nothing else um he just literally wanted to know the answer for his own selfish personal gain and when other people didn't there were times when other people didn't want to hear it he wasn't persecuted nearly i mean he wasn't really persecuted like galileo was but at one point he gave a presentation to the royal um to some, to some set of intellectuals in England. And the guy who was in charge of the, um, in charge of the uh, committee, Robert Hooke, didn't like a lot of things Newton was saying about light because it refuted what Hooke was saying. And Newton didn't bother sharing anything about his work with anyone for like 20 years after that because he's just like, what's the point? Why would I tell people when they don't want to listen? And so telling other people about it was just so secondary to Newton. He just wanted the answer and that's it. And I, I think that is, so I, I, I bitched and moaned for so long about how irrational physicists are. Like, yeah, there's a lot to say. It's a huge injustice. Um, but then I asked, what the hell am I even, why does this matter? Oh, it's because I want to be a physicist. I want to discover things about the physical world. So I'm like, okay, well, stop bitching and do it. Harriman gave you a lot of things you need to do the job. Do it. Stop, stop complaining and do it. Now, now, this is actually in, as a, as a foil to the other guy I wanted to tell you about, who is uh, a, a lesser known physicist, Ludwig Boltzmann, um, who came up with statistical mechanics. And Boltzmann lived in um, Germany in the late 1800s. And as you may, uh, you know, as you'll discover from reading uh, The Ominous Parallels by Peikoff, pre-war Germany was a philosophical uh cesspool um yeah like it was the, their philosophical the the physicists were explicitly against making 
physical hypotheses about things we couldn't directly see. For example, atoms. They, they didn't think, we couldn't literally see atoms back then. By the way, we, can't, we couldn't literally see atoms until I think 2001 or something like that. Um, but they couldn't literally see atoms back then. So they didn't believe in them because they, say they, they were of the philosophic conviction that you shouldn't talk about things you can't literally see. Um, yeah, like, um, and, and Boltzmann was against this. Boltzmann had a theory of statistical mechanics, which assumed the existence of atoms and talked about, you know, cause and effect relationships instead of the simple appearances, you know, just coming up with mathematical schemes of describing appearances. And he was rejected. He was laughed at. And he realized the reason for this was he had, and Boltzmann actually realized that the reason was because of philosophy. But Boltzmann just didn't have the genius of Rand when it came to philosophy. So he couldn't untangle the crazy knots that people were in back then. Um, but he did try. I, I lined up some Boltzmann quotes. I, I mean, well, I already had these stashed away, but here's one of them. Here's, here's, this isn't even a quote. This is a title of one of his lectures. This is a lecture he gave in philosophy. Here's the title. Proof that Schopenhauer was a degenerate, unthinking, unknowing, nonsense scribbling philosopher whose understanding consists solely of empty verbal trash. That's the name of the, the speech. <laughs> um, he was, uh. So he was, he was a firebrand for reason in his time. Um, but I think he just couldn't hold it together and he ended up killing himself. Um, he was the only one who fought for the ideas he uh he believed in um but i think i think there's a certain um you know he, here's a here's a quote by him he says bring forward what is true write it so that it is clear defend it to your last breath newton wouldn't have done that if they don't want like i, I mean and and i think newton is right on some level that it should be more like this Discover what is true. Write it so that you're clear on it. Repeat. If other people don't want to know it, I mean, that's... I may change my mind on this, but I'm not that interested in convincing other people. Mostly just because other physicists seem too confused or second-handed. I'm not going to... Or both. I, I'm I'm not concerned. I'm not going to blow my brains out trying to explain it to them. I I'm just going to figure it out myself. That's the plan, or or die trying. Can present physics theories account for the process of photon creation and destruction? <sighs> um, I don't have an opinion on that. Hmm. I'm just I, basically uh, this this is a good time for me to actually say that. Um, I have not induced, I have not produced a rigorous induction of anything past the year 1860, I want to say. Now, my knowledge goes past 1860. Up until about 1920, I have a flimsy induction. By the time I'm done with my summary of, inductive summary of physics, I'll have like an okay induction of everything up till probably about 1920 but anything after that um i simply don't have an opinion on it because anything that i think particle creation and destruction was i don't know when the 60s maybe it was after 1920 is all i know the physics of 1900 through 1920 was extremely important and Compl and extremely confused. There is a ton of brilliant insights in that period of history, and they're completely entangled with a bunch of bad philosophical thinking and probably incorrect physics. So, um, and so anything that happened in the 60s because of induction, because of how induction works, anything that they did in the 60s would be based on that flawed work. And since I and so and since I don't I don't reject that flawed work I don't I don't just you know flip it the bird and say it's all garbage because it isn't it makes correct predictions it's getting something right but it's in it's entang all of that good stuff is entangled with a ton of bad stuff and I don't know where the good stuff starts and the bad stuff begins 
So anything that comes after 1920, with a couple exceptions, like Bell's work um, in the 60s, I think, uh, anything that comes after the 1920s, I don't really contemplate. I don't even watch the Discovery Channel because I want to actually know the answer. When you're getting your undergrad, in order, to, in order to pass the classes, you have to memorize stuff at such an insane rate. You don't have time to check it against reality, and they're not giving you the means to check it against reality. They're not giving you the evidence that led to the equations. They just give you the equations, and then you practice using them on the premise that they're right. So, you know, to, to have the perspective I do takes years upon years of resisting that mindset and then even more years in pro deprogramming all of that mindset that got in anyway even though you were resisting it but uh, like it's hard but that's the price you have to pay to be a real physicist and that price has not been paid by the people currently in academia